quest to make Goo.Gul's gadgets great, it's early in the morning on October 4, 2016, and in a few seconds, Rico Sterla will present Google's latest gadget portfolio to the world. He's not even six months into his new job, creating and running the company's ambitious new hardware division. In April, CEO Sundar Pichai had tasked Osterlo with turning the software giant into a gadget maker that can compete with Apple. Osterlo has barely had enough time to sample all the snacks in the mini kitchen, much less conceive of and ship a bunch of products. Yet here he is, tall and broad, clad in a grey short-sleeved Henley top, visibly nervous as he enters stage left and greets a room full of reporters and analysts in a converted chocolate factory at the top of a San Francisco hill. It can't help Osterlo's nerves that minutes earlier, Pikai was out on the same stage making a grand case for the historical significance of this day. We're at a seminal moment in computing, Pikai told the audience, as he explained how artificial intelligence would create a revolution on the scale of the Internet or the smartphone. Google's efforts centered on Google Assistant, a virtual helper that Pikai had first announced a few months earlier. Assistant promised to create a personal Google for everyone on Earth that would help them find information, get things done, and live life more efficiently and enjoyably. Pikai made clear that Assistant was a bet the company kind of product, and that Google was deeply invested in building the gadgets that would put Assistant in people's hands. Then he introduced the new guy, Osterlo, who was going to make it happen. Over the next hour, Osterlo and his new co-workers introduce a half-dozen products, including the Pixel phone, the home smart speaker, and the Daydream View VR headset. None of them were Osterlo's idea, the folks in Mountain View had been building hardware long before his arrival. It's just that most of it wasn't very good or successful. Google could no longer afford to make ho-hum gadgets. Alphabet, its parent company, had become the world's second largest corporation by building software that worked for everyone, everywhere, delivered through apps and websites. But the nature of computing is changing, and its next phase won't revolve around app stores and smartphones. It will center instead on artificially intelligent devices that fit seamlessly into their owners' everyday lives. It will feature voice assistants, simple wearables, smart appliances in homes and augmented reality gadgets on your face and in your brain. In other words, the future involves a whole lot more hardware, and for Google that shift represents an existential threat. Users won't go to google.com to search for things, they'll just ask their echo because it's within earshot, and they won't care what algorithms it uses to answer the question. Or they'll use Siri, because it's right there in a button on their iPhone. Google needed to figure out once and for all, how to compete with the beautiful gadgets made by Amazon, Apple, and everyone else in tech. Especially the ones coming out of Cupertino. Google does have some huge advantages, its software and eye capabilities are unrivaled. But the company has tried over and over to build hardware the same way it builds software and learned every time that that's simply not how it works. Its supposedly innovative streaming device, the Nexus Q, flopped dramatically. Its best-in-class Nexus phones were eclipsed by competitors, and even its own hardware partners, within months. And Google Glass, well, you know what happened with Google Glass. Osterlo wasn't hired to dream up new products. He was brought in to teach a software company how to endure the long, messy, totally necessary process of building gadgets and to change the company's culture from the inside. It's not enough to have great software in the industry's finest collection of artificial intelligence researchers. To take on Apple, Google had to finally learn how to build good hardware. The man in charge of Google's hardware renaissance has always had a weakness for gadgets. Growing up in Los Angeles, Osterlo has fond memories of taking apart the junk computers in his dad's office and trying, unsuccessfully, to reassemble them into one epic supercomputer. Yet his first love was sports. Tall and athletic from an early age, Osterlo was an all-section volleyball and basketball player, and he enrolled in Stanford not because of its Silicon Valley card but because it was a great school in California where he could keep playing sports. In his freshman year, however, he sustained two knee injuries that threatened to end his athletic career. Osterlo hit an emotional bottom. 
So much of my identity was in athletics, and I had to totally reinvent, he says. He started seeking other ways to feel the same highs he did in sports, a team working toward a common goal, the thrill of accomplishment, the joy of the daily grind. He found his way into an engineering program and worked hard to make up for his late start in the major. Something about computers engaged the strategic, problem-solving part of his brain that had once been filled with inbounds plays. Osterlo is still a sports nut, his Google office is easy to find, it's the one with the huge poster of Warriors star Stephen Curry on the window, but the tech industry quickly became his home. After graduating in 1994, Osterlo landed a consulting gig, but he didn't like that all he made was documents and presentations. So he went back to Stanford, this time for business school. After a summer internship at Amazon, he took a job at the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins Cofield Byers, where he researched possible investments in mobile technology. BlackBerry was starting to generate interest, and Osterlo dove into a case study of it. He set up BlackBerry's first device, the interactive pager, and was amazed by how well the little messaging machine worked. He couldn't stop thinking about it. Kleiner had a company called Good Technology in its investment portfolio, and it sent Osterlo to help it figure out a business model. Originally, Good's plan was to build modules for the handspring visor, a modular PDA that many thought would be the next big computing platform. Good's first device was an MP3 player module called Sounds Good. But the visor never took off, and the Sounds Good sold terribly. Osterlo presented a new idea, let's compete with BlackBerry. He thought Good could develop simple syncing and messaging software, and because BlackBerry by this point had become immensely powerful and valuable, any competitive idea was attractive to investors. Good raised millions. Good was supposed to be a software company but it needed a vessel for its code. The leadership team met with BlackBerry, which had recently begun making smartphones. Once BlackBerry execs saw what Good had built, they hated it, because it was way better than their software, Osterlo says. And they realized we were an enemy, not a friend. Palm and Danger were working on smartphones, as was Nokia, but none could match a BlackBerry. It became clear to Osterlo and Good that the only way to give their software a home was to build devices themselves. They began working on a BlackBerry-like gadget they called the G100. Osterlo lights up remembering the days he spent building the G100. It was so fun going through the design process, testing it with users, he says. Everything about it was new and complicated, getting the keyboard just right, tweaking the trackball until it felt perfect making sure the battery lasted several days. It was so hard shipping that product, Osterlo says. When we shipped that thing, I was like, this is what I want to do forever. Not only had he found his calling, he'd learned that the only way to get the most from your software was to build the hardware to match. Unfortunately for Osterlo, Good didn't want to make hardware forever. The G100 shipped in 2002 to rave reviews, but others in the company saw it as a mere reference device, a blueprint of sorts for other companies to follow and tweak. They assumed the phone industry would turn out like PCs, many companies would produce hardware that all ran the same software. Yet there were no good phones to build for. We went through this desert of terrible device after terrible device that never ran our stuff properly, Osterlo says. Good built software for every phone it could find eventually even working with contract manufacturers like HTC to try to improve the experience, but it never again found something that worked as well as the G100. Businesses would come to us and say, we love your software, but we hate trios, Osterlo says, referring to the smartphone line from Palm. He never forgot that. In 2006, Good was bought by Motorola the one-time feature phone giant whose reign was under siege from smartphone makers. Motorola had no real software expertise and no plan for smartphones, and Good came riding in like a white knight. But the timing couldn't have been worse. Only days after the acquisition closed, Motorola's Razr, once an incredible cash cow, stopped selling almost overnight. Apple announced the iPhone not long after. Osterlo knew it was coming 
Before the Motorola deal, he and Good had worked with Apple to build a good software into the new device. He told his bosses, many of whom dismissed Apple's touchscreen oddity, that they were laughing in the face of the future. While he'd been meeting with Apple, Osterlo and Good had also been working to integrate their software with an operating system for smartphones called Android. Now, as a Motorola employee, he saw Android as the company's one defense against the iPhone. Osterlo became convinced that the only hope for Motorola was to produce a competing smartphone as fast as possible, and that meant using Android. Eventually Motorola came around, largely due to the efforts of new CEO Sanjay Jha, who showed up in 2008 and almost immediately shut down every division but its Android 1. Osterlo helped create and ship the Clink and later the Droid, which was the first great Android phone and the device that saved Motorola. Not long after, Osterlo left for Skype, where he spent two years as head of product. But his break from the hardware world was brief. Google was in the process of buying Motorola for $12.5 billion and was looking to place new leadership at the company. Dennis Woodside, a longtime Google exec who had been chosen to lead Motorola, and Jonathan Rosenberg, a senior vice president at Google and longtime advisor to the company's founders called Osterlo to see if he might want to come back and lead Motorola's product management team. Google's offer seemed like a perfect match, a chance to build hardware within Google, working alongside the now wildly successful Android team. With Google controlling both hardware and software, they could at last take on the iPhone. Except that's not how it turned out. Terrified of alienating its other Android partners, like Samsung and LG, Google went to great lengths to keep Motorola at arm's length. There was effectively no technical integration, Osterlo says. And that wasn't quite what I expected. He thought he would bring software and hardware together at last, but instead Motorola was treated as a wholly separate company. It was tantalizingly close to my dream job, he says. But it never quite got there. Google's relationship with hardware has always been awkward. Most of the company's physical products are born the same way, someone has a great idea for software, but they can't find the right gear on which to run it. That person then sets out to build the missing gadget with very little help. Google tends to treat these products as reference devices or sources of inspiration, proving that an idea can work and hoping an ecosystem of hardware makers takes it from there. As a result, Google's list of orphaned products and abandoned ideas, from the Chrome box to the Nexus Q to the Nexus player, is enough to fill a circuit city. That and hash x27 semicolon s no surprise, making hardware runs counter to Google's entire corporate culture. The company shuns process and management, two things a hardware maker can't do without. In its software development, Google actually encourages and applauds chaos, inviting anyone at the company to just build something and see if it works. At one point, Google even experimented with a corporate structure involving no managers whatsoever. The company's most successful products are subject to constant refinement. Former CEO Eric Schmidt calls this system ship and iterate, and in his book How Google Works he makes a consistent case for not even trying to get things right the first time. Create a product, ship it, see how it does, design and implement improvements, and push it back out, Schmidt writes ship and iterate. The companies that are the fastest at this process will win. When Google became Alphabet, all the company's longer-term projects broke off, to give them breathing room away from Google's ruthless product scythe. They were all called in shots, as if anything that takes longer than a year might as well be impossible. Ship and iterate simply doesn't work with hardware. A single tweak can cost weeks and millions of dollars. Every small change ripples through the entire supply chain, changing vendor timelines, requiring new tools, and slowing everything down. If one part is late, you'll miss your ship date, and it's not like you can move Black Friday. Oh, you want 50% more product than you thought? You'll get it in 6 months if you're lucky.